friends, and welcome back to Market Shares. I'm your host, Tony Blodgett, and today I have repeat guest, uh, Lisa Britton. Uh, Lisa is, man, we, we go way back. We were just talking about it. Lisa and I have worked together for over 17 years, um, both of us with lots of years in the industry, but, but together for the last 17 of it with about a 60-day break there in between when, right. when we change companies. Um, but look, I, you know, I attribute a lot of the success, uh, that I've had personally, but that our team has had, uh, to Lisa, she is our operations manager and, um, you know, really drives the pipeline. She's kind of the glue that holds everything together. And we do so many episodes talking about sales strategies and, you know, different things around the sales side of the business. But the reality is, is that no top producer can do a good amount of volume without having a smooth process once the loan gets turned in. Because if you're spending all your time working on your loans after they get submitted into processing, well, then you're not going to be very effective at building your business. And Lisa really handles that part of the business. Once a loan officer turns in a loan file and it's ready to go to closing, um, that's where her and her team really take over and make sure that gets to the finish line. So uh, I thought we would talk a little bit today about kind of what we're seeing in the industry today, maybe some reminders for people about uh, what you could do to be more effective with your loans so that um, as we anticipate this industry picking up a little bit, um, I don't think it's going to be, you know, significant and overnight, but I think we all need to kind of brush up on what it looks like to be busy and how to really work with our operations team. I think Lisa has kind of the behind the scenes, um, view into maybe some ideas for loan officers. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to be back. On I, camera. <laughs> back on camera. And it's your favorite place to be, right? Right, right. Like, like all operations people, they love being front and center. Yeah. Uh, but I will say our last episode with Lisa had a, a, you know, re really good views and people really liked it. So I think it's going to be a, a great episode. Um, you know, maybe we just talk about, you know, for operations people over the last couple of years, you know, lots changed, right? A lot of people working from home, a lot of people remote. I mean, we've always had a pretty remote um, you know, group, but, uh, any, anything you're seeing there as far as, um, you know, a desire for your processors, underwriters wanting to be remote. I mean, do you think we ever go back to in person or do you think it makes a difference? And, and what do you do as the person kind of overseeing, um, productivity and making sure things get done? I mean, the underwriters don't report to you, but you do, you know, you do dish out their workload and, and turn, and you see turn times, um, what are your thoughts on the work and remote thing? How's that worked out? I think it works great. We've had it for years, like you said, and um, I don't see it going back to people being in the office. I think that that's maybe a thing of the past. Um, one thing that I do, and I just had this conversation with someone the other day, is I think the mentorship part is lost a little mm. bit. Um, I remember, you know, when I started off my career, you know, you move up through the ranks, and the way to do that is that person next to you. Right. I remember taking, you know, people who worked at the front desk and next thing you know, they're the junior and they're a processor and maybe they're an underwriter someday where you don't have that person next to you to share. So you have to really be willing to jump on board with these video calls and screen share, share your laptop, you know, and and kind of get there. But I think that's where there might be some trouble. And I know underwriters, the govy underwriters are kind of aging out of the system. So we kind of need to figure a way to get that part back on board. Yeah, that's a really good point because you think about most processors probably started, you know, in some sort of a, you know, admin type position and then kind of moved into processing right. and maybe were able to do order outs, things like that, that kind of got them, got their feet wet, if you will. And yeah, I mean, without people being in the office, gosh, I don't even know how, yeah, it's really difficult. It is very difficult because when we hire processors here, we want them to be senior level, right? right? And so we don't really have a platform for training them up. Um, some, you know, aspects, you know, around, you know, de depends the model we have set up at the branch. There is some, you know, availability there. But that's one thing I think as we see time will tell on, you know, as a workforce, how that's going to look. Uh, yeah, it's something to really think about. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I appreciate you bringing that up. So I want to, you know, we're going to get into some some basic stuff, I think, that, that law officers can do from a productivity standpoint. But you know, the thing that just gets me more than anything is when a file, 
you know, gets close to closing and something goes wrong, right? Um, and it doesn't happen often, but what it does, it's like, man, so many things could have been done differently to avoid this situation from happening. And it almost always seems to come back to um, that there wasn't a very thorough, you know, review of the loan file up front. And, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of blame loan officers for that. I mean, there's a lot of checks and balances along the way. But the reality is, is that it seems like a lot of loan officers will, you know, talk to a borrower. They think that something's going to come together or they think they can prove, um, you know, certain assets or certain parts of their income or a second job or whatever it may be that they think is going to make that deal work. And so they make those assumptions. They tell their processor, hey, you know, we're going to get this. And what ends up happening is we get so far down the road and whatever it was they thought would come together isn't coming together. I mean, is that right. is that what you see as you well? Yeah, I think that that is uh, a lot of it. I think that, um, and that, again, you get with the technology, we don't have the paper 1003s anymore and you're reading it, flipping back, putting a sticky on it. So you're, everything's in a computer system. So you're reading, reading the, the 1003 through the system and then you're flipping over to another page to look at the documentation where the breadcrumbs aren't really all there sometimes. And so I think the old fashioned going back to Tony Blodgett's way of taking an application, I go to this all the time when I talk to LOs is, you know, getting out that yellow pad and writing it down when you're talking to the borrower. So when you're reviewing their application, you can say, wait a second, you said you had, you know, this auto loan, but I don't see that here on the credit report. Oh, that's because that's in my brother's name. You know, is those kind of things like you didn't glean enough information yeah. out of that conversation and make sure it got through to your 1003 that they do electronically online. Well, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it seems like so many loan officers now have delegated the application taking process to the internet. Yes. Right? They push their borrower to their website. And I get it. I mean, I think 96% of applications, you know, in our region are done online, uh, which I'm a big fan of. And I used to do the same thing after... <laughs> after I had a very thorough conversation yes. with that borrower where I asked them all of the important questions that I knew we needed to have answered in order to put a file together, right? To know, do we have the income? Right. Do we have the assets? What are their liabilities? How are those structured? What are they doing for a down payment? Where's it coming from? I feel like a big miss right now is that a lot of loan officers aren't having that conversation. They have a very preliminary, if any, conversation with their borrower. They send them to a website to fill out their application. I mean, they might miss some things. They, you know, they're, it's, it's not. Super they don't know thorough. what's relevant in lending. Right. They don't know what's relevant, and uh, and then that file just immediately gets pushed in in, in into processing. You know, right. and if that's the case, personally, I feel like the loan officer hasn't done their job. Uh, I feel like it is the loan officer's job to make sure that the file that is being turned into processing is closable as structured by the loan officer. Exactly. And um, yeah, so I think going, yeah, going back through what the borrower inputs that you review it and talk about it. And I see quite often that it's kind of like the don't ask, don't tell. It's kind of like, oh, let's see if it gets caught. Right. Right. But it's better to be proactive and you talk about it with your borrower up front to say, hey, we have this potential hurdle. So if it comes up later, can you be prepared to dig up this information so that in the 11th hour when it does get discovered, that it's not, oh, I got to go dig it out of the box in the garage because it's on the moving truck or, or whatever, you know, so that we can talk about that. I might need those old pay stubs to complete your two-year work history or whatever that may be. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, it's so second nature. I, I was given a referral the other day. I don't originate loans today. If I get one, I hand it off to somebody. But um, this young young man was referred to me by my uncle and... I was in the airport, actually. I was coming back from a work uh, meeting. And so I had a quick conversation with him, but I can't help myself. I immediately go into like loan <laughs> officer mode. And even though I'm at the airport, you know, I'm like, oh, he's self-employed and he, he owns a, a business. He does, uh, you know, swimming pools and stuff like that. So then, you know, I'm immediately going, okay, so, you know, uh, you know, how's your income structured? What did your tax returns look like the last couple of years. And now do you pay yourself with a W-2 then as well? Or, you know, well, no, you don't. Okay. And, and what does your wife do? Well, my wife works for me. Okay. So does she get a W-2 then? Or is she just working with you, you know, as part of the business? Oh no, she actually gets a W-2 and a pay stub. And, you know, and so these little things that, you know, just in a brief conversation, 
you know, I didn't have my yellow notepad, but I did have a notepad and was taking down some notes. And so when I handed that off to a law officer, I was like, here's all the things that we're going to need. And it was a 10 minute conversation with a borrower. And that seems like so simple. Like you would right. think that everyone's doing that. I would think everyone's doing that, but I know in fact that they're not because we, I don't think a lot of loan officers were trained to slow down and have that conversation. They might feel uncomfortable asking a borrower some of these questions. Um, and I'll tell you, for me, it's very natural because I did it for so long. I can't not do it. I'm like, I don't know if I can help you. It, it's not like I need to see your application that you fill out online for me to tell you if I can help you. I mean, ultimately, yes, I need that. But I know what it's going to take to put a loan file together. Mm -hmm. I know what stable income looks like. And we're going to talk about variable income, questions you might ask around that. But, you know, I know what in stable income needs to look like. I know what documented assets. Matter of fact, I asked him about his assets. I was like, oh, so how much money do you want to put down? Oh, I put like $80,000 down. Oh, is that in your checking account or is that money that's in your business? Oh, well, it's in my business right now. Okay, so we're going to need to talk about that, right? right? Mm -hmm. And you know, those are the kind of things where if a borrower just says, hey, I'm putting 20% down, I got 80 grand, you might think no big deal, but it's like, where's the money at today? You know, And if you're a seasoned loan officer and you're hearing me say this, you're like, Tony, duh. 101 stuff, I am right? telling you right now, there's a lot of loan officers that don't take the time to slow down and have this conversation. And I don't... I don't blame them if they weren't ever taught to do mm -hmm, this. Right. You know, it's so important that you really have in, in your mind exactly how you're going to put this borrower's file together before it ever gets to your team, before it ever gets to processing. Loan officer needs to know that. And it's not as simple as just letting them fill out their application online. And sometimes and you have to really it. look at it from a disinterested party because you get passionate. You've made this relationship with this borrower because you've heard everything they're excited about their house, and now you don't see it as clearly as somebody else does, mm. right? I can look at something that jumps off the page at me, and somebody's going, what, why would you ask that? I'm like, well, what, you didn't see that large deposit on the bank statement? And you might say, oh, it's because they sold a car. Well, that's great, but we need to document that, right? right? And so it's, it's sometimes that's where your team will help you, right? They're the ones that are reviewing it, and then they're gonna go back to you and say, hey, you know, Here's what we might need because I see this. And that's where you have to, that communication is huge with your team to be able to, you know, review it and then go back to your borrower and get it addressed. Well, before it, we have a problem at the end. And even occupancy things, right? Like a borrower is like, oh, I'm just going to buy this house. I, I really love the house right down the street from me. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about this. You know, it's yeah. not as simple as just, you know, is it going to be owner occupied? Are you trying to acquire a rental? What are you doing with your departing residents? You know, when a borrower tells you a story, like you said, you get emotionally interested in wanting to help them. And sometimes you need to zoom back out and say, how does this look? Because keep in mind, an underwriter, they don't even see the, I was going to say, they just see it on paper. They don't even see it on paper. They just see it on a computer screen in a folder, uh, in, you know, in, in the LOS system. And it's like, it needs to tell the story as well as anything else. They don't have the benefit of a conversation with the borrower, right? Who's, right. who's telling you what's going on. So I think that's a, a big part of it because nothing worse in my opinion than, and I know, I mean, I feel bad for borrowers and, and real estate agents who has this happen to them, but you know, the loan officer, if you're listening to this, you, you got to slow down. You got to take the time. You have to have built that loan file from beginning to end in your own head. You know how it's going to work. You know how you're going to document all of the uh, you know, the, the four C's as we talk about, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the credit, the capacity, collateral. How are these things all going to fit together in order to have an approvable transaction before you ever hit go, before you even send them to the, the internet to fill out their application? In my opinion, when a borrower goes and fills out their loan application online, it's really just there to validate the things that they've already told me in person, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. um, and, uh, and I think it's a lost, it's a lost art and it causes a lot of problems, which is why I bring it up. Um, so, you know, one of the things we, we, we talk about, one of the things that you do, um, for us is you manage the pipeline, right? You're constantly, you're up early, you're pulling pipeline reports and, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, how many files we have, where they're, what milestone they're in, you know, where they need to get to, by a certain timeline. And, you know, I don't know that 
I think this is kind of a lost art too. You know, I think that you've always, you know, you're very detail oriented. You're very task oriented on, you know, you know what needs to happen to get a file done. Um, but I feel like loan officers don't really think about the timeline necessary, right? right? And sometimes I get your emails, you know, and it's pretty early in the month. And you're like, hey, keep in mind, we got this holiday. We got this holiday. This isn't a rescission day, you know, whatever. Right. And at the end of the day, it's like, you have... 12 business days left. And I'm like, well, that's not possible. It's so early in the month. Yeah. Uh, but it's true. And I think people forget about that. So maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts around pipeline management and what do you think loan officers could do to be more proactive at um, managing their pipeline? Hmm, okay. Well, yeah, I'm a tasker for sure. I get up early and that's what drives me during the day. But um, I would say that just to always look at the calendar, right? In this business, I, I guess things just pop into my head, but it's like, I know when a right of rescission is. I know you can't count a Sunday. I know you can't count a holiday. Trid days got to follow the same thing. So you have to be thinking those dates in your head. So when I'm looking at that calendar and looking at our pipeline <clears throat> and I say, oh my gosh, there's 12 days left. Well, out of that, then we have to back out the trid days, you know, and so forth. So now it whittles it away. And so I know when we have to have our clear to close and our docs out because we don't want to come screaming in a closing with our docs. We want to get them there early enough so everybody can kind of be relaxed, right? right, right. <laughs> you know, that would not be, hopefully, you know, right? I mean, we all know that there's rushes that happen. But um, yeah, I think as a loan officer is just when you're setting the expectation with the realtors when they're out shopping, are we looking, you know, right now we're in an environment where everybody wants a quicker close. That's fine. But, you know, is a property a, a property that's the appraiser can get done pretty quickly? If it's waterfront, $2 million property, just know that the property is going to take a little longer. So you need to build that into your timeline. Um, if there's going to be, um, if the program is like a jumbo type program where it's going to be an investor specific to have a second set of eyes or something, you need to build that into your timeline. If it's a standard loan, um, you know, we underwrite those in one or two days. Um, but again, just knowing if your borrower qualified, your, your loan will go through just fine. Right. It's the ones that don't, and that's where it comes out. It's suspended, and then not recalibrating that timeline with, with everyone. Yeah. That's the part where I see when we're getting a phone call from maybe someone who's upset is that no one communicated to them when a hiccup happened, right? It's not saying we can't overcome it, but someone needs to get involved to say, yeah, you know, the appraiser ca appraisal came in short, or there's a work order we can't get past right now or we have to do a holdback. Or, you know, the borrower lost their job. They're on Boeing strike right now. Now what do we do? Right. Right? So now we have to recalibrate and reset the expectation. I think in, in this business I've been for 34 years, it's all about the communication. I can usually explain to anyone, and they might not be thrilled with the outcome, but they understand it. Right. Right? And if you can understand that, then, and you're communicating, then you don't get the upset people, right, that are calling you. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is, you know, this is, I'm really glad you brought this up because one of the things that I see with loan officers a lot, and I don't mean to pick on loan officers. I'm hoping people take nuggets from this and go, Oh, may, do I do that? Maybe, maybe I could do that better. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I think a lot of loan officers do is they're reluctant to reach out to either their borrower or their realtor when there's a problem. And I just got to say that I, actually went the opposite direction. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. So if there was a potential problem coming up, I would usually call my realtor, call my borrower. Look, I don't want to alarm you, but I just got word that this, that I thought was going to be this way is this way. And the reason I would call them early is two reasons. One, it might be nothing and I can solve the problem and we're right back on track. No time was lost. If that's the case, and some people say, well, Tony, if you could just fix the problem, why would you even tell them? Well, here's why. Because it brings value to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of potential challenges that can happen in the loan process. And if I never point out that there's ever any challenges, do I even bring any value? And so by pointing things out early, it actually helps you remind people that, oh, there are, my loan officer is doing something. They're He's looking an out for me. He's an expert. Yeah, exactly. So worst case scenario, I've shown them that I'm aware of a potential issue. I'm working on solving it. I solved it. Whew, thank God. No, no delay, no problem. 
But if it does become a bigger problem, I told them early. And to your point, not the problems are going to happen, but it's how you communicate them that matters. And if you brought it up early um, and then it does become a bigger problem, at least you were ahead of it. Everyone's aware of it. And you say, hey, you know, bad news. Worst case scenario here. I thought this might be the case, but here's the solution I've come up with. You can still come up with a solution and you can and you can solve their problem. But yeah. And, and then at that point, they're like, oh, well, gosh, are we going to need more time? They might even ask you, do I need to get an extension on this? Mm-hmm. Versus you hide everything from everybody, acting like there's no problems going on. And then you get to the very end and you realize you need an extension. And then they're like, what do you mean you need an extension? We're a week before closing. Like, that, what, what, what's going on? Now they lose all trust and confidence in you right. when there was a better way of handling it. So I would just, and I've seen so many loan officers do this. They just, you know, either they're... They're, they want to be the hero by not saying anything. Like there's no problems, which I don't know why there's no value in doing that in, in my opinion, because it, closing alone is it, it, there's challenges. So let's talk about it and let's be open about it and, um, and then solve those challenges and then communicate that the problem was solved um, or, or it doesn't get solved. And then you just look like you kept it from everybody, which right. you did turns out. Yeah. And that's yeah. bad. And you have to, like you said, the value, there's a reason why they're paying a loan officer to do this and they're not going online with some online company that there's no person behind yeah. it. Right. Yeah. And that's where I guess I come from is that, you know, know your craft. You know, if there's a problem, maybe you need to find a different type of loan. Maybe it needs to go FHA now instead of conventional or the opposite. Right. And that's where you get to play that role in there and say, hey, we might have to make a change here, but here's what my solution is. I could still save the deal. And now you look, you know, valued to that realtor. You didn't lose the deal. You yeah. might've just delayed it a day or two. Yeah, right? exactly. Well, yeah. and look, I mean, there really is no push button, get mortgage. I mean, great marketing uh, slogan. Yeah, right. Great marketing tagline. But I don't care what company it is. There's things that need to get, you know, processed through a loan. And any one of them could cause a little hiccup if it doesn't, um, you know, turn out the way that you thought it was going to. So, be super proactive with your communication. Um, you make a really good point about the dates and the timelines. I honestly, I was a loan officer. I didn't even look at the calendar. I didn't think about it. I would. This is a, probably an area where I was very overly optimistic. Right? It would be the middle of the month, so it's like, hey, can you close this deal by the end of the month? I'm like, sure, no problem. Like, that's my, <laughs> no problem. No problem. You know, we'll make yeah. it work. But yeah. you know, we we gotta slow down. We gotta. We got to look at the calendar and know exactly what we're up against. Yeah. And just like anyone out there, we can always do things in a pinch and a rush. And that's what you have me around for to help push things. Right. But, you know, if everything's a rush, nothing's a rush. We know that. Right. And so and also we value our ops team. We can't expect them to work night and day every day of the week. Right. Right. And we want to get it done. You know, and they they feel just as vested. Believe me, in talking to them, they're like, no, no, I want to work on this. I want to get it done. For yeah. that. Well, right. I think we've got uh, used to maybe pipelines not being as, as, as full. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, well, they have time for it, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, I expect pipelines to, to build, you know, I, again, I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but we're going to get into a busier season, more busier than we've been the last couple of years. And um, so this stuff is going to become more and more important. Uh, my favorite analogy is that, you know, every car on the road can't be an ambulance, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, does, there you go. it doesn't work, right? You gotta, you gotta be able to make room when the ambulance needs to come through, and that's what a rush should be. It should be um, occasional, but it should be able to uh, move when it needs to. Um, all right, so we, we we touched on this a little bit, but I want to hit on this because I I hear about this a lot, which is variable income. Um, everyone kind of has their different way of looking at variable income, but it it's become a pretty significant factor in determining someone's income. And it all stems back from Fannie and Freddie and how they look at what's considered variable income, what's considered stable income. And, um, and I think this is an area where loan officers may need to recalibrate. Um, and this has been, it's, this is a new thing. This has been happening for a while, but I still have a, have here of loan officers that will talk to their borrower and think just because they're an hourly employee that works full time that I can just take their hourly wage times 40 hours and plug that into my 1003 and don't look at the pay stubs and don't look at the W-2s and send it on through thinking it's very straightforward. 
And then you get a pay stub and it shows, oh, this week was 38 hours and that week was 41 hours and this week was, you know, different. And now all of a sudden we have variable income, right? Right. So, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. Like what are some best practices that a loan officer could do um, when they're putting a file together if they're concerned about the variable income? And I think in talking with you earlier, it sounds like technically anybody who's working an hourly way, they're not a salary, like salary would be considered stable employment. If you're an hourly wage and your hours vary at all, or even if your hours don't vary, would you still be considered variable income? Well, the the problem is, is the limited information sometimes up front, even, you know, for the loan officers. So again, bar says, oh yeah, I'm full time. And you're like, oh, okay. And you might see it the one pay stub they hand you and it says 40 hours, but maybe they didn't get their calculator out and they didn't, you know, do the year to date average and, oh, guess what? It does, that doesn't support it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to fact check, right. You need to be looking for that. And then you need to ask them some questions. Well, why does this not tie out? And it might be, oh, well, you know, every year I take a week off unpaid, you know, the company closes down at Christmas or whatever. Oh, you don't get paid for that. Okay. So maybe we need to look at that. Or maybe there's just, um, you know, I get to take every Friday off but we don't get paid for it or, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's just causing you to ask more questions, yeah. I think, to get your head around it. And then also now we're seeing more and more um, employers reporting through like the work number. And those VOEs can be great and they can be horrible at the same time. Great because they're automated, you get them quick and they're nice to read, but they're so lacking in information, um, like a Boeing one. It, they're, they don't give you all the information of what the other pays mean. Right. And underwriters really want to use that pay, but they need to know what it means. Because if you are on a comp plan that maybe part of that is uh, an income we can't source, we can't use, right? You know, you have your base pay. Right. And maybe it doesn't tie out to the 40 hours. And because on their on the VOE, it will say number of hours average, it'll say 38, it won't always say 40. Right. You know, so that's what they're looking at. Then they go look at the pay stubs. The next thing you know, the underwriter's doing their math. And then they're saying, guess what? They're variable. And that's not a deal breaker. It just means you might have less income than what you thought. Yeah. Well, right? and some people's pay stubs have things in there like per diem, right? Certain jobs might yeah. pay a per diem. It's not consistent. You don't always get that. We can't right. use that. They might, some, some, I've seen some people when you can write off um, employee expenses, they will show, through yeah, your pay stub, right. you know, and that's not income. It, it's a reimbursement yes, for, exactly. um, for certain things that you might have had to do. There's lots of things like that. And then if, if you're trying to break out, um, you know, for instance, overtime pay separate from base pay, but the VOE, the way it comes, just kind of lumps it all together. Well, now you have no way of breaking that out. And Fannie requires that you break out overtime separate from your right. base pay because it's used in the underwriting determination with DU and you know. Right. So, you know, if you can use like a day one certainty or something where it's validating that work number VOE in on the income and it'll give you that approval threshold, you're good. Yeah. Right. Um, but when you don't is kind of when we're looking at that further and tying out that income. And again, it's not that we can't use it. It just can't use maybe all of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's just the old fashioned. We used to look at, oh, 40 hours times, you know, 25 bucks an hour. You're good. Um, where you actually need to get the calculator out and ask those questions. Yeah. Um, and then looking at how long. I mean, if you're only a few months on the job, and you haven't been there at least 12 months, and you know now the underwriter might be going, okay, now I need to see your last pay stub from your last job, and we need to start comparing apples to apples to see if we can use that in the average, right? Because they want to see at least a 12-month, if not 24, but they right. want to see a 12-month history. Right. One of the questions I used to always ask, and I would always have my HP when I was doing my yellow notepad and I would ask a borrower, you know, how their income structured. And if they were hourly, um, I would say, okay, how much do you make an hour? And they'd say, whatever, $27 an hour. And I would do 27, 20, 80. I'd be like, okay, so your W-2 should be around whatever, you know, $64,000. Is that what your W-2 said last year? Um, actually, I think last year it was 55. Oh, why was that? Well, I got a raise part way through the year. Okay. Or to your point, oh, I, 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 I took some time off. I was actually laid off for a, a month and I came back. Yeah. We were on strike, right? right? I mean, the whole list of things yeah, comes yeah. up. Or it's like, no, actually, my W-2 is like 90000 Oh, well, why is it 90000 Oh, well, I get overtime. I get a Christmas bonus. I get, so many things can come up right. just simply by taking their hourly wage times 12 and asking them if it matches their W-2. Now, you can check all that when, it, when you get the documentation, but I've already moved on to go originate a new loan. 
right? That's why I do all that during that initial conversation. Right. And is because I want to get all this done. I want to know in my head, this is a deal. And now everything else that comes in after that is validating that, verifying that so that my processor can move that file down the pipeline while I go get another loan. Otherwise, you're getting right. re involved in your loan again um, once all this documentation comes in, mm -hmm. you know. So. And to ask all those questions, you know, throughout the last year, you know, were you offer any family leave or any of those things? I think those are the questions that kind of get missed too. And again, when the documentation arrives and they're off, then you kind of have to slow everybody down. Wait a second, we're in contract now and, and you know, and wait, I need to figure this out. And then you're like, oh yeah, it was on FMLA. Yeah. Okay, we need that documentation now, right? And yeah. so just those things, I think you need to just probe a little bit more. Well, and I wish <clears throat> those things were few and far between, but they're not. No. It happens all the time, you know? Well, especially in Washington with our new FMLA, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. The yeah. husband and the wife both take time off. You know, so we're seeing a lot of it. Yeah. So, I mean, these are not, um, they need to be asked in almost every situation. You know, we need to do a better job of, um, of really qualifying our borrower up front to save these challenges down the road. I would say almost every, there's certainly things that come up that you, you couldn't have known. The loan officer couldn't have known. But the majority of the issues, when I get involved in a customer service issue, it's usually because things have gone off the rails they're like, I want to talk to the manager. They talk to me. Hey. First thing I do is I call Lisa. Hey, do you know about this file? Like, let's dig into this file. And we start digging into it. And almost every time it could have been avoided early on with a more thorough application. Um, right. Loan officer. Right. I think so. And I think it's just also, you know, my plug for that I always try to say is know your craft. You know, it's kind of knowing and staying up on industry news and what's hot topics. Um, you know, there's a couple of news things you can read every day. And if you're reading and watching things, you'll see what are trends in our industry, right? So you know that, oh, you know, we're, you know, the agencies are asking a lot about variable income or whatever, so that you're kind of picking up on those things so that you know what red flags to be watching when you're interviewing your borrower. Yeah, well, like occupancy fraud. I mean, you know, that becomes a big hot topic and all of a sudden you wonder why your underwriter is asking for a motivation letter for a borrower and you're like well what do they need that for it's like well it's kind of they're not really I know. Moving, they're not they're kind of moving down and they they have a, three rental properties i mean it's not a and it may question. make sense totally when you talk to them but on paper it doesn't make sense so right. that tells me you should have added something more to the file a really good loe you know we still ask for those even though we're electronic you know, underwriters love to read those letters um, from the borrower to kind of tie things together. Yeah. So one of the other things that I see that causes a lot of um, pain, I know for you guys, uh, but for everybody involved, is loan officers that just, they just, they just hold their files. Mm -hmm. They just want to coddle yeah, that file yeah. for a very long time um, and not get it moving. Matter of fact, one of the reports that I look at very closely is uh, application, application date to submit it to underwriting. You know, what is that timeline? And I will tell you that it is vastly different. Most top producers are really good at taking an application and getting it turned in quickly. I mean, I'm talking, and I'm talking application, like this is like the like application pull credit and this thing's in underwriting in seven days, you know, six days. I mean, this is, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're moved. That means you've met with the borrower, you've got all their stuff, got all disclosed their documentation, it. disclosed it, all that stuff. You know, it's been reviewed and it, it's in under it's it's under in in underwriting. That's fast. I mean, ten days or less. Um, you see other you know loan officers, even some branches, because sometimes this becomes like a systemic issue within a branch. Is um, you know that twenty four days, thirty. It's like what what are right. these people doing with their files? You know, so and then and then what happens is is all of a sudden there is a contract. Right. It has a definitive date. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's this big scramble to like, hey, we got to get this. And you're like, it was turned in like three days ago and you want to close it. Right. I think days. it goes back to not being willing to talk to people about some issue that came up. OK, so like for that example, what I see anyway in, in the field is that, you know, oh, I got to wait and hold this because the borrower has to go get some money or they got to do this or they got to get another pay stub and all these things because they didn't really qualify I'm very good at the beginning. Mm. Or, you know, something changed. They bought above their means maybe. Now they got to, you know, get a raise or they got to do whatever, right? And so they're holding onto that file to massage it enough to get it in to where it's approvable, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of the wrong way. They need to go back to 
the beginning and say, okay, we're going to need a 30 day extension. And I know no one wants to hear that. Right. But either that or maybe they need to back out and then come out and buy again. Yeah. I, you know, but I am, I see that a lot. Right. That's usually why it's being held for so long is that there's some problem that they're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to save this? Because they know they can't push it forward. It might be a decline instead of just owning up to what the problem is right there and dealing with that. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm well, and I think some of it is just, um, they're not holding their, they're not setting the right expectations with their borrower on how important it is to get stuff in. So I, I don't, yes. I don't, you know, sometimes the borrower is dragging their feet and I get that, but we have influence over that, you know, by our scripting, by the words that we say, you know, what the expectations we set for the borrower, like, look, if I'm going to close this loan on time, I know it's 30 days from now, but I need to get your documentation back in 24 hours, exactly. right? Or, you know, and, and when my processor reaches out, we need a response within 24 hours. And then you need to follow up if they don't, you know, so setting that expectation and not letting a borrower, look, you're guiding them, they're paying you to guide them through a smooth, successful mortgage process. It's complicated. They need to be told what to do. It's our job to, to tell them what to do. Right. They don't know what to expect necessarily. Right. So if you explain them every hurdle or everything that might happen along the way and say, anytime someone from my team reaches out, we really need a response within 24 hours. It's really important that you have a service level as well as we do. Right. It, everybody has to be on the same page that every time we do something is 24 hours. So we really would love the borrower to be in that same timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about service levels in a minute. But so so one problem, loan officers holding on to their files. The other problem is they turn their file in and they babysit it the whole time. You yes. know, do you see this? Um, it seems like less of a problem because people are remote. Like loan officers would like hover over processors' desks back in yeah. the day. Like, oh, what's going on with the Smith file? Right. You, know, you can't do that as much today with with people working remote. But I definitely see um, loan officers that hover around, checking in on their loans electronically, going into the system, seeing if it's approved yet, um, versus like go get another one. Like, okay, your job's done. You're and. It's, it's in our title, like we're MLO, we're mortgage loan originators. We originate the loan and then we go get more. Yes. Uh, let the let, let the process do its thing. And so um, any thoughts on, on Yeah, on and I have lots of thoughts on that because I am a systems person. So I think of a loan as a widget, right? They all might be different loan types. Every borrower is different, but everybody has their part to play. The loan officer or their LOA have to do these things. And it gets turned into the next stage and then they do the order out and then they turn it into the next one and everybody has that service level and once you turn it in as a loan officer if you've done your job and you've gotten everything and you qualified them go get another one we don't need you hanging out because right. the processor is going to communicate you know with your borrower and with you right they're gonna con log note it they're gonna be sending daily updates on it or you can have a pipeline meeting right you know whatever you decide your method of communication will be with your team that works, but after that, we, we really just don't need too many hands in, in the pot, right? Yeah. We just need each person who's an expert at that piece to do it. And if your team is following their service levels, which we manage to yeah. um, along, then it will close on time. Now where it falls off the rails is things where we can't get borrowed to communicate back on something. So that's where you have to be, your, your team is telling you that. And if you're ignoring that fact, because you don't want to be the guy who's going to go rattle their cage, then that's where you need to own up to that part of it, right? Because, you know, the processor can only ask so many times and then we need the loan officer to get involved sometimes. Right. Um, you know, an appraisal issue or, or a property issue, that's where we need to have the loan officer come back in and work because we want to maintain that relationship with the realtors and the sellers for our loan officer. At least at NAF, that's how we do it. Um, so that's another part that can kind of fall off the rails. But other than that, the file just keeps moving. And uh, with a good team, you're going to see that communication. And you really should just go do what you do best, and that's originate the loans. Yeah. I, I think some, some loan officers, they may not have great operations. I mean, I know how we run ours, how you run ours. And um, I have a lot of confidence that you turn that, it's like a conveyor belt. You know, you do your part, you set that widget on the conveyor belt, it's going to move through, assuming you did your job right up front, and that we're going to meet service levels along the way. I think this bad habit of babysitting loans for some people comes from not having great operations in place. And so they feel like, man, if I don't 
babysit this loan, it's not going to get done. Or it's, and maybe more likely, it's just from a scarcity mindset. You know, they, they only have one or two loans and they're going to, you know, it's like, it's like my little baby that I need to make sure, you know, that it's like a little egg that I need to make sure it doesn't crack. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, look, I mean, that's not necessary if, if, if the system's built, um, if the system's built right. Um, so what, one of the things that we talk about, and I think it's worth highlighting is the way that we run operations here is service level driven. So what that means is, and if you don't have this in place at, at your company or in your branch, you know, this is, in my opinion, the only way to run it, which is you, you can't manage just to a closing date and then work backwards. And so what I hear some processors will do, not here, but what I've seen in the industry is, oh, well, you know, hey, if you looked at the Smith file, it's like, oh, no, I, I got a bunch of other files I have to get to first. That thing's not closing for 45 days. Like that is unacceptable. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that's managing to a close date versus managing to service level. Service level looks like that file gets turned in and it's going to get touched in a predetermined amount of time, 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever that mm -hmm. established service level is. And then we're moving down this conveyor belt at service level intervals. And then if you're done early, great, you're done early. Now, you might need to re-verify a certain thing if you're done way too early, but that's okay. That's where we want to be. So, um, you know, first in, first out, service level driven, you know, process. That's what we run. That's what you right. Right. manage, right? Yep, yep. And the service levels may change based on a bottleneck in the system, right? Because, you know, all of a sudden you're at month end and, um, you know, it's just it just seems like there sometimes is a bottleneck, but okay, so now instead of 48 hours, we're at 72, maybe on a new filing end, right? Because we got right. a ton of resubs or something, but we still manage to that. And then we just add in more help to get those done. But we always keep our eye on it, right? Right. So that you can always check our service levels every day they're posted and know, oh, I don't have to worry. My file is there, right. you know, someone has it, you know, and the processor on it or underwriting team or whatever, you're seeing those status updates. So if you're you're watching the statuses from your phone or whatever in the field, you don't need to call somebody. Right. Well, the other thing that I love about the way you guys run operations is you document everything. I mean, if you know, right? What's the saying? If it if it, if it's not in the conversation log, it didn't, it didn't happen. happen, right? Yep. And so what I love, this is one of my favorite things, is when a lot of officers like frustrated because a file, you know, the, there's a problem, and they'll call me and be like, you know. I don't, know, I don't think my underwriters touched it in like six days and this thing's falling off the rails. I'm like, really? That seems odd. Uh, so I call Lisa and she pulls up the conversation log and she goes, well, this is what we did on this day. This, I mean, you guys log every single yes. thing that happens. And 100% um, of the time, I can we can see exactly what happened. If someone ever said, hey, if we ever had a really frustrated borrower or realtor and they said, what, what happened with this file? I promise you, we could give you a log of every single step that that file took along the way and what the challenge or what the problem is, you know? And that is, for someone who runs, you know, a, a large region, large division, it's so helpful to know that everything's documented and if there's a frustrated borrower or a frustrated referral partner or whatever the case may be, that there's a, there's a history of it, there's a log of it. And this, this took some time. I mean, we couldn't always count on it to happen this way, but um, you know, I feel confident that we can tell the story. And oftentimes I'll be like, Hey, I'll reach out to, to Lisa or, you know, Lori uh, Hendricks, who, who runs our, um, who's our processing manager and be like, can you just give me the timeline on this file? And like, it is like time stamped and like, here you go. Like, <laughs> know. Which do you want to know? Right. You know, I know. And, I know. Um, but, 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 and it's not to defend our position sometimes when people go on vacation or they get sick or, you know, heaven forbid something really bad happens. But I mean, we have to jump in that file, still a file, right. right? And we want to jump in and just take over. We don't want to have to go try to investigate the whole file. So we go right to the con log. Anybody calls me, that's the first thing I do. And we look at it and I'm like, okay, well, great. Underwriter seen it yesterday. Here's the conditions, processors out sick. You know, one of my backups will jump in and they, they know exactly what to do. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's so great. It is so great. And look, if you don't have this at your company, because <laughs> not everyone, uh, a lot of people watch this, you know, who different mortgage companies, different parts of the mortgage industry, like this is something you, this is like a non-negotiable, mm -hmm. you know, right. I, it's not easy. Um, and I think at first, maybe our processors didn't love it. 
uh, because we implemented this years ago. I mean, before Mm -hmm. we were even at New American, I think we were doing kind of a similar thing. We've had the system for a very long time. Um, But what you come to realize is you you can't take a vacation. You can be out of town and realize someone can step right into your file and know exactly what's going on. And it is a CYA. I mean, it does... It, it, it does cover you if someone says, hey, this didn't happen, this didn't happen. And it's like, oh, no, it did. Here's the notes. Here's what happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do it. So if you're... Looking- and it'll happen where you miss a note you, or you didn't sure. hit save or something, right? And that'll happen. And they know when I go to grab a file, I'm like, hey, I can't figure out what happened yesterday on this file. And then like, oh, okay. You yeah. know, uh, so we know, you know. No one's perfect. But, yes, exactly. I think that's in this business, we all know that if it's a loan, is a loan, it things can and will go wrong. Yeah. It's how you can recover from it, how you can still bounce back and have that knowledge on how to get the job done, yeah. uh, that you've hired an expert that can figure out what do we what do? we do? How do we solve this problem? Yeah. Right? But, but I, I guess the point being is that, you know, look, there's going to be things that slip through the cracks. But what's not acceptable, in my opinion, is a processor who has like their own note system. <laughs> you know, yeah. these are all my notes for just me, you know, and whatever the case may be. It should be memorialized in a system that everyone on the team has access to. It's just a best practice, mm-hmm. you know, for our exactly. industry. And and I would like to think everyone does it. I know that they don't. And I've had some really great processors who I'm sure, you know, would be like that, you know, that they do their own notes. It's their own system. But it and that might work most of the time. Until there's a problem, until they're upset. heavy file, until, file volume. Yeah, heavy. Yeah, something like that, right? Yes. The other nice thing about doing it this way is everyone does it very similarly. So if for some reason you know a processor leaves, or we have you know we're growing like crazy, and so we need to bring in a new processor, they can be trained to do things very similarly. Yeah, you're gonna have different personalities, but for the most part, everyone's following the same system. And the other thing I love is it's it's reportable, right? So one of the things that you do every morning is you. Um, do the pipeline and you know we can see where every file's at in in the process we know if you know and it's color coded right based on you know like if i see a lot of red on there that means these you know we're, we're within five days of closing and docs aren't out yet like that's a problem so you know having a very um thorough system um during the loan process allows for reporting that can also be very thorough and uh, make sure that everyone stays on track right right yeah. And then that reporting goes out to the manager, so they're fully aware. So we don't want to keep information from anyone. And then the processors then get a separate report, right? Yeah. They work on it. Yeah. No, it's phenomenal. It's, um, you know, if anyone, like I said, if anyone's hearing this and that's not the way your operations is running, um, get with your operations leadership. And uh, it, 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 it is a game changer, has been for us for many years. And we've stopped hearing about issues. I, you know, it seems like, you know, 10 years ago, it was like always, you know, processing under, you know, loan officer, you know, the, the processors and the loan officers would argue and, and there was, you know, no clear communication and, and, um, you know, and when, when everything's done like this, there's service level expectations, things are documented. It just doesn't allow. Room Everyone has a responsibility in the conveyor belt, yeah. right? And it just has to kind of move through, I think. So a few other things that are snags and loan files that we'll talk on here before we, we wrap up, um, is you know property issues um you one thing you mentioned is recognizing when you have a complex property that's going to require a longer appraisal <laughs> that's a big one right. you know people forget about that um but but other things that i've seen trip up files recently is you know like a rural des- designation you know property you know some certain programs especially in the non-qm space yeah. you know rural is a big deal right so um you know is the property rural or not what determines that um, is it unique in some way? Yeah. Right? yeah. And then you mentioned like multiple structures, right? Is there like, here's another, I mean, we did a whole episode on this not that long ago about DADUs, right? All the properties that have yeah. detached ADUs, attached ADUs. I mean, these are, these are going to be the norm moving forward. And, you know, how it is, here's the other thing that's going to be a big thing is condos because a lot of these houses that are building DADUs are then condoizing them and you have like these two unit condos and stuff like this. I mean, these are all complexities that are gonna come up and um, they can impact your appraisal, they can impact your uh, underwriting guidelines, et cetera, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's probably more important than ever that you're looking at the true listing, the link to the listing. You're going out and you're reviewing what the listing has, you look at the pictures, you're, you're jumping out to the county site, then looking at the property profile. 
trying to determine it for a lot of different things. Do I need to charge more for the appraisal on my fees up front? You know, is it lakefront? Is it acreage? Is it, you know, something like that? Does it fit on the program? Is it FHA and it's all this excess acreage that I've got to make sure we can comp out and adjust and, you know, or is it a jumbo program that has very strict guidelines on unique properties or rural properties? Yeah. So it's very important that the loan officer is looking at that up front. Seems like a lot of times a, bar, a loan officer might say, hey, this borrower's credit profile requires requires me to switch them like from conventional to FHA, but then you don't think about the property and is that going to be an issue? Right? Yes, exactly. And then just the things like, you know, if it's not, if they're not a first time home buyer FHA and they already have an FHA loan, do you remember that there's a rule around that to get another FHA loan? Or you want to use rental income on that, but did you move 100 miles away? You know, it's all those things that, unless you stay up on guidelines and watch those announcements that come out, those will yeah. get you. Well, let me ask you about guidelines because, you know, I think one of the things that people reach out to you for is guidelines, right? Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, loan officers should, should have access. Are you, um, I'm going to give a little plug here to uh, the Knowledge Coop, uh, Ken Perry's company, because they have a phenomenal tool that's like AI for guidelines. Have you seen this yet? Uh, I'm using a different one that NAF uh, let have out to the ATMs. Okay, that, well, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you have like some sort of an AI tool to help find guidelines? I have one, but I'm um, I'm older school, <laughs> so I just know when somebody says FHA, I pull up the, the handbook, right? Four thousand point one, right? I keep the current version on my desktop, and I do the search, right? Manufactured home, boom, it comes up, or um, income section. I know exactly what page to go to, right? Because right? I've done it right. so many times. But uh, yes, I do like I use Mortgage Currency okay. as the brand, and I'll type in like all agencies um, ADU. And it'll bring me up the uh, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, whatever, side by side. And it might talk about it. And right. then sometimes you have to give more information to get more of a defined answer. Yeah. But it, I think that is going to be the trend going forward. Um, and it's really nice. It's much better than all regs. I'm not a fan of all regs. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, Fannie's guides, uh, FHA, they're just so easy to read. And yeah. I know it's because I'm a guideline person. Right. But because some people just look and they just see words, right? right? But it jumps off the page at me. But um, I think if you learn how to read them, you know what to look for. Yeah. Right. You, you know that I'm going to funds to close. Right. Or I'm going to the income section. And then, you know, you just go there and you second job income. And then it's going to tell you yeah. right, what you need. Two years, you know, no breaks. Right. Of both jobs. Right. Well, I remember like, you know, when I got the business 27 years ago, I was like handed the Fannie Mae seller guide, like you need to read this. And I'm like, you know. The Mari I, guys were so nice then, oh, the right? Mari guys oh my great, gosh, yeah. I loved them on my desktop. Um, and we use those often, didn't we? Um, but I, I think, you know, understanding guidelines, it, it's again, this seems so 101, but I'm telling you, they change, it's complicated, and law officers don't read enough guidelines, in, in, in my opinion. So um, the reason, that, you know, there are even all regs. Someone just was telling me about a website that you can go to. It's, it's a paid website, but it basically is an AI search for all regs guidelines. Oh, okay. So you're going to see more and more of this. The reason I mentioned the knowledge coop is because a lot of loan officers get their, you know, we have to take CE classes. You can do the CE classes through uh, the knowledge coop, but you can get access to their AI tool. And for loan officers, super user friendly. Um, to go through and, and do that. But uh, more and more, you're going to see guidelines available and searchable through AI. Uh, I'm, I'm actually right now trying to put an episode together to talk more about AI and how to use it practically in the mortgage industry, yeah. right? And uh, I think guidelines is one area that's, that's, that's huge that um, loan officers should um, you know find a good tool that, that works for you and, and know your guidelines. And here's the other benefit of it. I mean, one of my favorite things to do, and you know this from back when I used to originate, you know, not that I like to argue, although, you know, I think <laughs> yes, I missed my calling as an attorney or something. Um, you know, I always love debate and I, you know, I have no problem. I've actually enjoyed sitting down with an underwriter many times you, cause you <laughs> managed the underwriters back then. And we'd pull up the guidelines and we would you know, I, I would argue my position. You'd be saying that's a or, not an and. Yeah. And, you know, and like, okay, let me read that again. And that is one of the things like I push back on now, yeah. right? Is I read it. What does it say in black and white? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's an or. 
Right. Right. And so we get this or this, right? Yes. It's not all of it. Yes. Right. And so that is where you have to be able to, like, I keep going back, know your craft. Yep. You know, when you want to make an argument with someone, know you're right. You know, that's been our thing is like, don't come back and, it, you know, you can ask, but it, don't come back and throw your weight around if you're not kind of sure of what it says in the guideline, you right. know. Um, well, and yeah, and so many, you know, and this is, this is a, there's a delicate thing here, right? So an underwriter might, you know, say, hey, I need this and this. And then you might go pull the guideline and it says, no, you need that or that. Right. And you might think, well, the underwriter would be frustrated, but they would actually, if you showed them the actual guideline, where it's at in the Fannie Mae guideline, and that it says or, they're going to be like, oh, okay. I can. It, it gives them a defensible position yes. to, um, to agree with you. Because here's the thing. You would think that the underwriters would know all the guidelines all the time. But they don't because they change all the time right. too, right? So you're underwriting a file, and who knew they changed some wording in something? Right. Because the announcements come out, and you either seen it or you didn't, or maybe there was no announcement, and you know they're happy to relook at it. I mean, and say, hey, yeah, what what does that say? Okay, yeah, I didn't know they made a change, or I've been reading that wrong all this time. Yeah, you know, now it's note to self, and yeah, I can note the file and move on. Yeah. So that's why I think that loan officers knowing the guidelines and having access to them is is really helpful because look most of the time the underwriter is right they know their guidelines that's their job that's mm -hmm. all that's all they yeah. do every day but if if you're going to challenge them you should make sure you know the guideline too and then challenge them based on what it actually says in the guideline and why you think that what you're providing meets that and, and, and if not they'll yeah, tell you make why. your case that's make what i case. do like you said you know i i make my case a lot on deals because i'm trying to help save them um, and, and I always do. I pull it out and say, okay, here's what the guideline says. Here's what we have. Is there a gray area that's really not totally defined, but here's my observation of it. And you make your case for it. And then someone's going to look at it and come back and you might still agree to disagree, but you're going to kind of get to where you think that yeah. you know, we're going to make that decision. Well, I think a loan officer is always more valuable to their clients, to their referral partners, to their realtors if they are well educated in guidelines you right. know you just sound smarter you are smarter mm -hmm. um and you know pay, paint yourself into a corner you know because you know you know what to ask for so and it's um, much easier to to quote a guideline to someone saying well the guidelines say instead of saying oh yeah that underwriter says that right right i just when i hear things it's like no it's not an overlay it's not the it's truly the agency's guideline yeah we're all selling to the same place yeah right all right well you guys, we could probably go on all day, but look, I, I hope this episode for those of you who are maybe our newer loan officers, um, and yeah, I'm, there's a lot of newer loan officers. I'm really surprised how many newer loan officers there are in our in industry, and some of them are doing very well. Uh, but you know, maybe some of this conversation you haven't been exposed to, but if you're a seasoned veteran, look, now's the time, like get your house in order and work with your operations team. I mean, this is a, a partnership that has spanned almost 20 years now. And as a salesperson, um, you know, having a relationship like the one that you and I have or the one that I have with, with Lori as well, it's been so important to my success as a top originator, branch manager, you know, leader. Um, and you have to work with operations and it has to be a symbiotic relationship. You have to understand the challenges. And, and if you lead teams, you know, share this with them or coach your loan officers in the same sort of way to help out your operations team and really make it a bond. It can be, um, you know, for so many years, it felt like there was this sales versus ops. And we haven't had that for a very long time with our teams. Matter of fact, I've had loan officers that have left and come back because they miss our ops. I mean, it's a sales tool. It's a recruiting tool. We recruit to Lisa and her team and it makes a big difference. Yeah. And again, I would just say, no matter where you're at, embrace a system. Every high producer, when you talk to them and you interview them, they all have a process flow that's very defined. Yes. The, the onesie twosie don't, they're struggling and it's because they don't have a good process flow. Systems, systems, yeah. systems. All right, guys. Well, thank you for your time and attention here on Market Shares. Look, if you like this episode and you like what we're sharing here, please let someone know about it. That's all I ask of you. Um, I think there's a lot of loan officers, a lot of people in the mortgage industry who could benefit from these types of conversa conversations, and they may not even know that we're here. So if you found us, let someone know about Market Shares. And until next time, take care. Thank you.